Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hi, welcome back. Uh, we're here with lecture three now, to, um, uh, which is designed to basically give you an overview of uh, the components that uh, reside in an atomic force microscope. Uh, this lecture is difficult to give because uh, each of you out there have a different, different type of microscope. Some of you may have made your own. Others may be using an instrument that's 10 or 15 years old. And yet there's, 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 there may be others of you that have just recently purchased a new instrument. So the level of technology and the instruments that you're using may be completely different. And so for this reason, um, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to focus more on the components of an atomic force microscope rather than a particular system. And I want to try to give you a, a, a very broad overview of the types of issues that uh, go into designing and building an atomic force microscope. I'd like to try and mention some of the limitations uh, so that when you start to get uh, images that maybe are difficult to understand or interpret, uh, you have some background uh, uh, that, that, that maybe gives you a, a, a way to think about what you're actually observing in, in the lab. So uh, what's so special about an atomic force microscope? Well, the answer to that question is that it's a, it's a proximal microscope. It's, it measures very local properties, and it also allows you to measure uh, uh, features on a substrate in the third dimension. So optical microscopes and transmission electron microscopes and scanning electron microscopes don't have this capability. Uh, where inherently this is built into an atomic force microscope and uh, it's for that reason that these, uh, this atomic force microscope is referred to as a scanning probe microscope simply because it's probably the most important uh, scanning, uh, most important member of the scanning probe microscope family. <clears throat> the uh, original paper which I encourage all of you to look up uh, that describes the uh, atomic force microscope is this paper by uh, uh, Binig, Quait, and Gerber. It was published in 1986. Uh, this paper is one of the most widely cited uh, uh, manuscripts ever to be published and, and uh, hopefully all of you have resources that will allow you to read that original paper so that you can see how the instrument was uh, uh, first uh, uh, put together. Um, why the atomic force microscope works? Well, <clears throat> it, uh, the, the idea is really simple, right? You're trying to measure these interaction forces between the tip and the substrate, and uh, um, these interaction forces contain an awful lot of uh, very interesting physics and chemistry at a very fundamental level. Um, so the idea is to uh, position the tip at a fixed distance above a substrate. Uh, the tip is going to be attracted to the substrate by the interaction force that we discussed in the first week of this course. You want to measure that interaction force. How do you do it? Well, you basically attach a spring to the tip. And the spring exerts a restoring force uh, uh, that counterbalances the interaction force between the tip and the substrate. And if you can then measure the deflection of the spring, and you know the spring constant of the spring, you can then infer the restoring force required to maintain uh, an equilibrium balance between the interaction forces of interest and the, uh, the, the, the uh, restoring force exerted by the spring. Uh, <clears throat> the the uh, typical spring constants that you might need uh, in order to achieve this goal uh, you can sort of figure that out from a very simple back of the envelope calculation. You know roughly the frequency that atoms vibrate in a solid. You know roughly the mass of an atom in a solid. Uh, if you take the ratio of the, re the vibrating frequency to the mass, you find that uh, the spring constant that connects the uh, atoms in a solid is something on the order of a newton per meter. And so, therefore, you're going to need a spring uh, that exerts this restoring force, and the spring constant of, of that spring is going to be on the order of a newton per meter. Uh, 
Uh, so that's the, the general guideline that gives you a, a, a sense of how, how stiff of a spring you need to, to use. Uh, of course, nowadays these, these uh, springs are, are achieved by using a micro cantilever. Uh, these micro cantilevers are, of course, widely available. Um, you, you can just go to the internet and, and purchase them uh, overnight. Uh, this is a far cry from the early days of AFM where we used to uh, uh, make our own cantilevers, uh, try to attach tips to the end of wires. Uh, it would take days to make a, a cantilever and it would only last for a few minutes sometimes because the tip would fall off. So these uh, commercially available uh, force transducers uh, really have uh, changed the, the, whole, the whole business, right? They, they uh, allow uh, the practice of atomic force microscopy worldwide. Uh, the cantilever is the restoring spring in the atomic force microscope. It then becomes important for you to be able to detect the deflection of that spring. Um, and uh, there have been a variety of techniques uh, proposed to do that. Uh, I just sort of give a simple uh, schematic diagram here that lists some of the more uh, uh, useful uh, approaches that have been tried. Uh, of these approaches, the one with the uh, focused laser beam uh, reflecting onto a position sensitive uh, photo detector, this is by far the, the, the one that's uh, achieved the most, uh, most use. So um, a lot of our discussion uh, in the remainder of this course is going to be designed to uh, understand the physics and optics associated with that uh, um, focused laser uh, means of detecting the deflection of the cantilever. I also wanted to mention something about the cantilever dimensions and the notation that we're going to use. Uh, both part one of this course and part two of the course attempts to use a standard set of notation to describe the physics uh, behind the operation of an atomic force microscope. So in order to do that, we need to establish a convention for dimensions of a cantilever. And uh, the conventions that I'm going to use, I'm going to use L, capital L, for the length of the cantilever. I'm going to use small w for the width of the cantilever. And I'm going to use small t for the thickness of the cantilever. Now, very often, uh, we get into a situation where um, these parameters, capital L, small w, and small t, are also used for other uh, parameters. And whenever that situation arises, uh, then I will subscript those, uh, those symbols with uh, a, a c to indicate cantilever. So for instance, if we're talking about time, um, uh, the symbol small t is used to discuss or to represent time. And uh, if the thickness of the cantilever has to be referred to in that context, we'll tend to use the, the notation t, small t subscripted with uh, c. So hopefully this notation will be um, uh, uh, consistent throughout both parts of the course that, that you've uh, signed up for. Um, we have to say something about how the cantilever motion is detected. And uh, that, that discussion is, is conducted on this slide. Uh, basically, I want you to think about a cantilever uh, that has a certain length, capital L, associated with it. Uh, if uh, you apply a point force to the end of that cantilever, two things will happen. One thing will happen is the cantilever, uh, the end of the cantilever, the end of the cantilever now will move through a distance which we refer to as Q. And in addition, the angle that the cantilever makes uh, will change by an angle in the, that I call d theta in this slide. <clears throat> if you focus a laser beam onto the end of the cantilever and the cantilever angle changes by a, a, an amount d theta, then the laser beam reflected from that cantilever will change by an amount 2d theta. And it then becomes useful to <clears throat> detect that rotation of the, laser, of the reflected laser spot. And the way that tends to be done is by using this segmented photodiode. Uh, it's indicated by the, 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 the gray box at the top of the left-hand top of this slide. This photodiode is split into two, two segments. 
for the, for the purposes of the discussion, let's just focus on the two segmented photodiode here. Two segments are referred to as A and B, and each segment then produces a voltage that's proportional to the intensity of the laser beam that strikes that, uh, that uh, segment of the photodiode. So it becomes important to establish a relationship between the twist angle, between the deflection angle d theta of the cantilever and the force applied. Uh, the proportionality constant between d theta and the applied force are, is a constant that depends on the dimensions of the cantilever. We will derive that constant in a later lecture. I just state the result here. Uh, and also there's a, there's a, a relationship between the tip display or between the displacement of the end of the cantilever, which we refer to as Q and the applied force, and the proportionality between Q and the applied force is, uh, is again a, a constant that depends on the dimensions of the cantilever. So uh, again, we're stating that result here. We'll derive it in a, in a future lecture. <clears throat> if you focus on the photodiode, Basically what's happening, the focused laser spot is moving from uh, one segment of the photodiode, let's call that upper segment B, to a lower segment uh, A as the, as the cantilever deflection uh, is, is induced by this applied uh, force F. If you look at the output voltage uh, uh, of the photodiode, so that the output voltage is now going to be um, a quantity uh, which I, uh, I list uh, in the right-hand segment of this slide. The output voltage is basically going to be the difference between uh, V sub B and V sub A divided by the sum of V sub A and V sub B. And that output voltage is going to be proportional to the, the cantilever displacement at the end, which we refer to as small q. If you make a plot of that output voltage, as you slowly displace the laser spot uh, across the photodiode, you'll end up with a plot that looks schematically like that I've, I've shown in the upper right here. <clears throat> when the laser spot is, is squarely in the upper segment uh, B, there will be a constant voltage. As the laser spot is displaced and it moves from B to A, uh, you'll, you'll see that the output of the photodiode will actually change polarity will go from a positive to a negative number. And there's a point uh, on, this, on this plot, which is referred to as the null condition. And uh, when that null condition is achieved, the voltage coming out of uh, uh, quadrant B, uh, or segment B of the photodiode, is exactly equal to the voltage coming out of segment A of the photodiode. And when those two voltages are subtracted, you'll end up with a null voltage. And, and that would then, in principle, correspond to the situation where the laser spot is equally positioned on segment A and segment B. All right, so that's, uh, that's how the, the position of the laser beam is sensed um, uh, uh, as the cantilever is deflected. Uh, the, uh, the essential uh, uh, the essential physical principle behind an atomic force microscope is to rig up a system such that the force that's acting between the tip and the substrate is constant. And the way that is done is using a feedback circuit uh, to drive a Z positioner. And I've schematically indicated that in this, in this particular diagram. This is kind of the fundamental um, uh, electronic uh, uh, implementation of an AFM, and we'll use this uh, this type of uh, schematic block diagram uh, uh, more than once in the remaining part of this course. But basically, what's happening is you you have to apply uh, you have to select a set voltage, a reference set voltage, uh, and you compare that reference set voltage to the uh, voltage that comes out of this position sensitive diode. And uh, that's done by this feedback circuit. The feedback circuit then produces a signal to uh, adjust the, the voltage out of the photodiode so that it exactly matches your reference or your set voltage. And the way that's achieved is it's, it's achieved by moving the, uh, the substrate with respect to the tip. It moves the substrate up and down. Uh, 
And as the substrate moves up and down, the deflection of the cantilever changes. As the deflection of the cantilever changes, the position of the laser spot on the segmented quant uh, photodiode changes. And so you end up with this loop, uh, which uh, if the feedback circuit works properly, uh, uh, will eventually uh, achieve a balanced condition. Uh, in other words, the force on the tip will be maintained constant. Uh, over time. Now the feedback circuit um, is really a, a way to modify, uh, controllably modify a dynamic, uh, dynamical system and the goal is in a, in, a, in a logical sense the goal is to make some quantity that you want to control equal to some uh, set signal that you can, uh, you can, you can uh, uh, determine ahead of time. So this diagram is a very simple explanation of a feedback loop, right? It basically requires you to, to control a quantity, which is the output from the position sensitive photodiode. You compare that quantity uh, to a, a fixed voltage S, right? In principle, S could be a function of time, but in practice, it's often just a fixed voltage. You sum those two voltages with a summing device and then you rely on some uh, electronic circuit which is uh, governed by a control law K, capital K, right? And this control law, capital K, is going to try to minimize the error between the input signal and the quantity from the, uh, the signal from the atomic force microscope. So you want to minimize that error, you want to make that error equal to zero over time. And, and the way that's done is by putting out a voltage to a dynamical controller, which then adjusts the position of the uh, uh, substrate with respect to the tip in the atomic force microscope. So we're going to talk more about this feedback loop, and we're going to discuss the, uh, some of the principles that underlie it in a later lecture. And uh, we'll try to discuss how you uh, adjust this control law in order to optimize the performance of, of an atomic force microscope. So that's going to come later. Uh, <clears throat> uh, whenever you're trying to measure uh, separations between tip and substrates that are on the order of uh, a nanometer or less, uh, uh, thermal drift uh, becomes a huge issue. So what you have to do is you have to design this microscope uh, to minimize thermal drift. And thermal drift uh, is everywhere. Uh, it just any any time you have a, an object which has a temperature gradient across it, uh, the dimensions of that object are going to change with time. And I just run through a real simple calculation for uh, for typical metals uh, that uh, or insulators that you might find in an atomic force microscope. And it's pretty easy to convince yourself that if you've got a temperature gradient that changes at a, a, a one degree uh, centigrade every minute, you're going to end up with a change in the length of uh, some component in your microscope, uh, uh, which will be on the order of 10 to 100 nanometers per minute. So it becomes very important to uh, run this microscope under constant temperature conditions. It, it means that you basically have to le let the microscope stabilize over time uh, so that uh, these thermal drifts disappear. Um, you also have to, um, if you think about it, right, you're trying to keep a tip above a substrate to a precision of better than a nanometer, right? Uh, the vibrations in the floor of a building uh, can, can cause the the tip and the substrate separation to change uncontrollably. So you have to pay attention to uh, reducing floor vibrations. And schematically, the way that's done is you want to isolate your atomic force microscope from the floor of your building. <coughs> and what I show here is a simple uh, spring isolator system such that if the floor of the building vibrates by an amount delta Z zero, if the uh, uh, spring system attenuates that uh, vibration by a quantity alpha, hopefully alpha is less than one, then your, your microscope, which has a mass m, will be subjected to a vibration that's less than uh, the actual floor vibration. Um, 
So the trick here is to uh, stack up many different layers of, of vibration isolation. I try to illustrate the principle on the right-hand diagram of the slide. Uh, here, if you have n levels of vibration, then you can reduce or you can attenuate the floor vibrations by a factor alpha to the n, and uh, thereby uh, uh, achieve a, a vibrational, or uh, essentially a vibrationless table in which the uh, uh, tip is, uh, uh, can be positioned a fixed distance above the substrate, and that fixed distance can be on the order of a nanometer. So that's a really useful uh, uh, principle that you have to uh, uh, develop if you're going to build a microscope uh, and make it work. You also need to achieve vibrationless motion. Uh, so the substrate is being moved with respect to the tip, and that motion has to be done in a vibrationless way. Uh, historically, the way that, that has been achieved is by using uh, piezoelectric materials. Uh, historically, there have been two types of uh, uh, piezos used. One has been a piezoelectric bar, and the other, uh, which was introduced in 1986, is the piezoelectric tube. So by applying voltages to various uh, uh, electrodes that are uh, 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 plated on these uh, piezo materials, right? You can change the length of the piezo material uh, in, a, in a reasonably straightforward way. And some of the important equations that, that, that come into this are, are given here for your, for your reference. So these were the early uh, 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 components used in, uh, these were the, these were the, the position uh, motion devices that were used in the early versions of atomic force microscopes. Uh, these uh, piezos are notorious for uh, creep and hysteresis, and I just try to emphasize that here so that if you have an older microscope, if you're using an older vintage microscope to, to acquire data, uh, these uh, uh, limitations are probably going to affect you. Uh, the piezoelectric creep basically means that if you change the voltage to a piezo, uh, uh, the voltage change can be done very abruptly, but the mechanical extension of the piezo uh, creeps. It, it changes over time, and so therefore the, that there, there's an uncertainty uh, after you apply the voltage. There's an uncertainty in the actual position of the piezo due to this creep behavior. And then the other effect, uh, is the uh, hysteresis, which basically means that if you apply a voltage continuously to the piezo, so you slowly change the dimensions of the piezo. And then if you reverse the uh, applied voltage and take it back to its original value, uh, the dimensions of the piezo don't uh, instantaneously return to their original values. So there's, a, there's actually a zero shift in the position of the piezo uh, due to these uh, uh, due to this hysteresis. So to overcome this, uh, new uh, scanners, uh, new positioners have been designed. Um, these are referred to as flexure scanners or, or, or nano positioning stages. They tend to be about a factor of 100 more expensive than the uh, uh, early piezo tubes that you could, you could buy um, and use in, in microscopes. But the advantages of these ins of these uh, these uh, flexor scanners are that um, you now have a feedback control on position. So you have an actuator that moves a, a, a table. The table is uh, contained in a single block of material. And there are hinges that have been formed in this block of material using advanced machining techniques. Uh, these hinges allow the motion of the sample in a prescribed direction, and then you can have a feedback sensor uh, in incorporated in the flexure scanner, so you can actually measure the position of the, uh, of the, of the sample in real time and adjust the, the actuator to, uh, to adjust uh, to obtain a, any uh, deflection that you care to achieve. Uh, so these flexure scanners have, have given rise to a whole new generation of atomic force microscopes that are characterized by linearized scanning techniques. These linearized scanning techniques basically have a feedback control on both the X and the Y scanner, 
and they now allow you to precisely position the sample with respect to the tip, uh, uh, completely minimizing the, uh, the creep and uh, um, uh, hysteresis that we talked about in the uh, earlier slide. Uh, so this is a this is a very brief discussion of uh, some of the components in an atomic force microscope. Uh, in the next lecture, we're going to actually talk about how to calibrate uh, the microscope, what what steps you have to take in order to ensure that the data that you uh, you obtain from the microscope is accurate. And uh, so, if you come back for that lecture. Uh, We'll follow up uh, and uh, discuss some of the calibration steps that, that uh, you should be aware of. So thanks, thanks for your attention.